Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com. And yes, the moment has arrived. The first Igor Markevich box. The Phillips years, which are, of course, now on DECA, because Phillips is now DECA. Get it? I mean, yeah, that makes things much easier. So here we have a fabulous 26 CD box brought to you by Eloquence Australia. Yes, boy, do these folks know what they're doing. Nicely packaged with intelligent booklet notes and original jacket covers. And I'm putting it down here gently, gently, after we pet it a little bit. This is so exciting. I mean, this is just, just great stuff. I mean, I could end the video now and just say, get it, great stuff. But we have to go through it because that way we get to talk about the individual marvels which are contained herein. I mean, oh, it's so much fun. And some of the really ugly record covers that they had back in like the 50s and 60s. Some of the stuff is mono, some of it's stereo, all of it sounds fine for the most part. And uh, yeah, and here's your book. I need a booklet. I'll put down the booklet and let's just start, shall we? We begin with the La Moureux Orchestra, which was just such a great legacy. Markevich's recordings with the La Moureux, along with like the Paris Conservatory Orchestra recordings. One of you suggested that they should all be in a box. I suggested that they should all be in a box a long time ago. We should have a box of the La Moureux Orchestra and also the Paris Conservatoire. Of course, that would have to spread across different record labels which might be a little bit complicated, but you know, at least within individual labels, I don't know, we just should, because they were one of the great orchestras and they deserve the attention, particularly for their wonderfully French timbres, those lean sonorities, the plangent woodwinds, the piercing brass. Oh gosh, it's wonderful. Anyway, one of the confusing things about this that I should point out is that some of the Lamoura orchestra recordings were made for DG, some of them were made for Philips, and as they were reissued by Universal in various ways, some of the Philips stuff wound up on DG. Here it's all kind of sorted out as it appeared originally. So you'll see something like the Beethoven Fifth, so these just great performances, but they were on Deutsche Grammophon, not Philips. I mean, they were reissued on Deutsche Grammophon, but here they're on Philips. So, I mean, don't worry about it. It's all here somewhere. Just maybe not where you expected it to be if you didn't have the original LPs back in 1961 or 59 or whatever it is. So we begin with two Haydn symphonies, London and the drum roll with the La Moire Orchestra. Oh, these are marvelous performances. You know, they're so cool. And it's so wonderful to hear uh, you know, these Haydn performances before the period instrument folks got in so that you could really understand just how marvelous Haydn sounds on a full, big, modern orchestra. The music really is suited to it, tremendously so. The problem is that nobody ever cares about Haydn. And, and so these people never got to devote a, a series, a serious, dedicated uh, bunch of Haydn recordings until until Dorati came along and did all the symphonies. There were just very, very few. I mean, there was Bernstein doing the Paris symphonies. What made them so wonderful was that it was Bernstein doing the Paris symphonies. There, there, there just weren't so many recordings of them. But the ones that were there were generally done by people who really knew the music and who really cared and who really knew how to play it. People like Zell, people like Bernstein, even Eugene Ormandy. I mean, they just did wonderful Haydn. We were spoiled for Haydn. There just wasn't a lot of it. That's the problem back in the day. And Markevich was certainly one of them. So here you go. 103 and 104. Yum, yum. Well, where am I going to put these? I have to put them somewhere. I have to, well, let's put it on this side. Okay, that's fine. Then we get Mozart concertos 20 in D minor and 24 in C minor with the La Marlowe Orchestra and Clara Haskell. I mean, all of the Markevich-Haskell collaborations are classics. And rightly so, as much for the conductor as for the pianist. And I, I will say, for those of you who seem to think it's okay for Mozart pianists to conduct from the keyboard, and it is okay, but only okay, you really need to hear what happens when you have a master pianist and an equally masterful conductor. 
I mean, the result is just magical. And it has a sophistication and a depth of interpretive wisdom and nuance that you just aren't going to find the other way around. You don't. It's that simple. Okay, here we go. Beethoven Symphonies 5 and 8 with the La Moire. This is one of the great fifths. It was in my list of all-time great fifths. Oh, it's marvelous. So is the eighth. I mean, they're just both fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. Does it see what year they were originally done? 60, I think. Yeah. 1960 was number five, and 61 was number eight. And wow, mama, you ain't gonna hear Beethoven done that way these days. The finale of the fifth is just the most fabulously plebeian parade ground, you know, rabble-rousing sort of ferocious festivity that Beethoven obviously intended and that so few orchestras give, especially these people who, who play the music with this sort of, it's supposed to be noble, you know, and blended, sonority, rounded, blah, 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 you know, I mean, it's like, ugh. I mean, Markevich, I mean, he's like, okay, guys, trumpets, let's hear it, you know, blah, 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 da, 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 anyway, I mean, the tempos are not that way, but I mean, just the, just the hair-raising vulgarity of it all, but good vulgarity, yes, marvelous, and yes, here it is, the ninth, that last symphony, I had so many of those in like the last video. So a fantastic performance also. Yeah, you know, you just got to hear this. You know, Markevich, Markevich wrote an entire, uh, uh, you know, series of studies on conducting and, 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 and analyzing Beethoven symphonies. And he produced his own edition of them, which was published and which is still available. And he knew this stuff. My God, he knew this stuff. He knew it at a depth, at a level that so many, so many German Kapellmeister people would only dream of. And my God, he got that orchestra to play. You know, he didn't get along well with the La Moura Orchestra because they found him too disciplinarian. I mean, he left. He left after a few years because they, they couldn't tolerate him. But while he was there, he, he whipped them into shape. Okay, we've got another Haskell Markevich Beethoven Symphony Number no. 3. Yes, fantastic. Then we have the Brahms Alto Rhapsody with Irina Arkhipova with the Russian State Symphony Orchestra. Woo-hoo, an academic choir, the Tragic Overture, and Kodai's Salmus Hungaricus, recorded in Moscow. All these Moscow recordings sound kind of iffy. We'll get to that in a, in a moment when we talk about the Verdi Requiem. But, but it's, oh, they're fun to hear. It's fun to hear him get these Russian orchestras, again, to play with the requisite discipline. I mean, only, only Moravinsky in Leningrad was doing the same thing in Russia at that time. Although, I mean, I guess you had a Kondrashin too. I shouldn't say. I shouldn't generalize. But these are, these are splendid, splendid performances. And then we have, oh, yes, the Lamoureux Orchestra doing the Carmen Suites and the La Lisienne Suites. This is one of the great Bizet records in the history of Bizetitude. So you really ought to have it. I already talked about this. We did the video on the Carmen Suites. It's just marvelous. I mean, you really hear the opening of Carmen. It has so much swagger. Wow. You know, it really, it's not just the tune. You know, the tune is dum pa da 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 dum pa da 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 dum pa da 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 But the timpani are going boom, 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 boom. And then the trombones, they have a real high kick. It's um cha um cha um cha um cha And then the tune's on top of all that, but you hear it all. And it's, again, it just has this swagger, this, this, this unbelievable energy and vibrancy that nobody else comes close to. It's just wonderful. And now we start to get the Tchaikovsky cycle. Uh, you know, I did my ideal Tchaikovsky symphony cycles or best Tchaikovsky symphony cycles, and I think Markevich won. <laughs> I mean, he's one of the ones who wins, for sure. It's, it's absolute greatness, these Tchaikovsky symphonies. They're fabulous, and we don't need to go through them, go through them all the way. I particularly like the fifth. Oh, it's so wonderful because it's so anti- what everyone else does, and so faithful to what Tchaikovsky wants them to do. It's marvelous. Check out, check out in the first movement, in the first movement, that, that second subject, 
ya ra ra da ra ra ya ra 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 everybody slows down hugely Chekhov doesn't ask you to do that and Markevich doesn't and it just sounds so much fresher if you keep the tempo up you know near I mean you could relax a little bit that's okay but the way he does it just has such freshness it's wonderful and one thing that was not available for a long time was his Manfred symphony now I always thought this was a little underplayed um, I really did and uh, a little bit too perhaps balletic I thought you know it didn't have the hysterical guts at the big moments but I played it again and I listened to it again and now I've sort of changed my mind I mean first of all I, I turned up the volume a lot which helps and second of all I, I, it's 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 an awfully good man for it it really is so there we go and then we have Rimsky Korsakov the Scheherazade and Capriccio Espanol with the London Symphony exciting as hell oh my God, it's great. And the Scheherazade has all this precision and exotic color. And it's great. So, see how I'm just saying over and over again, great, fabulous, great, terrific, great. Well, it is. It just is. And and then we have the 1812 Overture with the Russian Easter Overture with the Kitserkabal. This is the one to hear. Wow, is it hot. It's just unbelievable, especially for the Tam Tam at the very end. Woo! It really lets go. And, and, and <laughs> Markevich cuts the tempo in half at the coda when the Tam Tam comes in. Instead of going, you know, everybody's just sort of rollicking along, but he slows it down and it goes, boom, 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 da, 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 crashes. Oh, it's unbelievable. And the, the, the uh, Palazzian dances with choir. And, oh gosh, you know, another one you just got to hear. Not well filled, particularly. Okay, Stravinsky. I mean, Markevich is one of the great Stravinsky conductors who ever Stravinsked. It's just tremendous. We get Apollon Musaget, suites number one and two for small orchestra, four Norwegian moods, and the Circus Polka. Very interesting little coupling with the London Symphony. And I mean, you got to hear him do Stravinsky because because he somehow manages. He somehow manages to give it all the rhythmic precision it needs while also making it sound like something. You know, it's not just an abstraction the way he conducts it. Somehow there's, there, there, there seems to be some, some extra at a level of depth to it, the way Markevich does it. I mean, he doesn't romanticize it, not a bit, because Markevich was not a romantic by any stretch of the imagination. Listen to his own music. It's even, it's even cooler than Stravinsky's. But he gets the Stravinsky style, and he knows he knows where where all the little Russianisms and things are, and it just, oh, it just comes out wonderfully. And then we have the Soldier's Tale with uh, Jean Cocteau and Peter Ustinov and other people. This is complete, and the Symphony of Psalms, which is done in Russia. Another one of these cool Russian recordings. This is a really cool performance of a cool Russian recording with boys' choir, by the way, with male voices all the way through which is particularly interesting, as Stravinsky actually originally suggested. Not that he always did it that way, but yes. And then we have, let's see, oh, the Symphony of Psalms again? No, of course not. That, this, this had the Symphony of Psalms on it. This is the cover, which, but the, it's on the other thing. And this one has um, the, the Mussorgsky songs orchestrated by Markevich and sung by none other than Galina Vishnevskaya. Oh, she was great. She was absolutely great. I told you the story about how, you know, I had dinner with her in Cannes and she sang Shostakovich's 14th Symphony to me. That was an event while Rostropovich sat across the table and told dirty jokes. That was a dinner to remember, let me tell you. And then we have Cherepnin, Tati Tati with with uh, Olga Rostropovich at the piano. This is Lishvishnevskaya. And then the Mozart Toy Symphony and Bizet Jeu d'Enfant. So, you know, all with Russian orchestras. See, the thing about Markevich that's so much fun is that it doesn't matter what orchestra he conducted because he was such a good conductor that he always got them to do what he wanted them to do. I mean, one of my favorite, I was I say Rostropovich or Markevich? I don't know, I meant Markevich if I said Rostropovich. Don't worry about it. One of the things, one of the things that I just adored him doing was the pictures in an exhibition with the Leipzig Gewandhaus on Berlin Classics. Because it's the Leipzig Kavanaugh's, but he, he, you know, he, he has them sounding so right in whatever music he conducted. He knew how to do that. He knew how to do that. Very different from Stokowski. 
Because you know Stokowski's Leipzig recording of, of like Stravinsky's The Firebird and all that stuff, he makes them sound like the Philadelphia Orchestra. Stokowski made every orchestra sound like a Stokowski orchestra. Markevich made every orchestra sound like what the composer wanted it to sound like. That's the difference between the two. Really, really cool. And then this fabulous disc of Verdi overtures and preludes with the new Philharmonia. Fabulously fun music and ballet music and all kinds of cool stuff. And let me see what else is here. Oh, the beginning of the Verdi Requiem. Now, the Verdi Requiem is the one that, I mean, it was recorded in Russia. It's a rather foggy recording. It's sonically, it isn't great. Um, but the, the soloists are Galina Vishnevskaya, uh, Nina Isakova, Vladimir Ivanovsky, and Ivan Petrov with the Russian State Academic Choir and the Moscow Philharmonic. And boy, is this a hot performance. It really is exciting. And even with the, the iffy sonics, I mean, the really cool thing about it is to hear that Russian choir. Oh my goodness, they sound wonderful. And the soloists too are really good. I mean, it's a really passionate Take No Prisoners, Let It All Hang Out, Verdi Requiem. Now we get, let's see, oh, we're coming to the end of this already. Uh, we're going so quickly. I, I mean, I can't believe it, but it's just such great stuff. I, I, you know, it, it just makes you get excited and go faster. Uh, um, a Mampu disc. I mean, this is, this is a classic disc. I mean, this music's not really readily available, a lot of it. Los Improperios, which is sort of like a cantata thing. And then we get him doing, it, it, this, this was a series called, called Sacred Music from Spain, Sacred Choral Music from Spain. Here it is. And this is the Mampu piece of it. And, and it really is amazing what's on here. See, Markevich, was, he was like a caris in that sense. He was just fascinated by music, all kinds of music. He didn't care what it was from. If he was curious about it, didn't matter what period it was, he would play it and he would play it well. Why? Because, because he was always grounded in those fundamental, basic musical values. Clean rhythm, good intonation, you know, knowing, knowing where the tune is, giving you know, balance of texture, all of those things, he just did them. And you know, it's amazing how well most music works when you do those basic musical things. All of this BS about proper performance technique and all this stuff, well, you know, that's very good. It's very nice, it really is. But when you have a genius conductor confronted with an unfamiliar piece of music and an idiom he doesn't know from a period that nobody plays, you can get very, very far on basic musical values. So here we have the Mompulos Improperios, and then we have Thomas, Thomas Luis de Victoria, his Ave Maria and Vexilla Regis. And these, of course, are, are you know, they're just choral works, a cappella choral works. And, and Padre Jaime Ferrer, Lamentation Prima. We get that. Um, and that's with, that's with the, uh, let's see, uh, with the Orchestra Sinfonica and Chorus of the RTV Española, Radio and Television Española. I mean, so that's, that's a, a later work by someone no one has heard of, but now we know. And then on this other one, we get uh, more Victoria, the Magnificat Primi Toni, and Oscar Espla. Yes, Espla de Profundis. See, he's mixing, he's mixing contemporary Spanish choral music with, and even sort of middle, like classical Baroque Spanish choral music with early, early Renaissance Spanish choral music. I mean, what a great program this is. It is so cool. And Ernesto Halfter um, and Ignacio Ramoneda, who lived from 1735 to 1781 and wrote a Veni Creator. Who knew? <laughs> Where did he find this stuff? Who cares? The important thing is that he did. He did. It's fantastic. And then we have dances and songs from Spain. Now this includes, oh my God, this is so cool. Um, this includes the Falla, um, Siete Canciones Populares Españoles, orchestrated by Markevich. I love those. It's all about suffering and pain. Here's that. Oh, I, I, quarto not pain in me pecho. Oh my goodness, I have a, I, you know, I'm hiding agony in my breast. You know, so 
fabulous. Very Spanish. And then we have Isaac Albanius' is Catalonia and Halfter's Fanfare in memory of Enrique Granados, and then a bunch of uh, Granados orchestrations, which are delicious Spanish dances and other goodies. So that's lots of fun. And then we have Liebes Zauber. Love the Magician. This is like the, the German version of it. But that's okay. We get Fire Nights in the Gardens of Spain with Clara Haskell, one of the classic, classic performances of that work as well. An amazingly brilliant work in their hands. It's gorgeous and full of mystery and sexy, sexy timbres. And, oh, yeah. and El Amor Brujo, which is wonderful. I love El Amor Brujo. It's so great. Even better than the Ritual Fire Dance. It's like the least interesting part, by the way. Can I tell you a story about the Ritual Fire Dance? I mean, I have to tell you. My, 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 my aunt, I had a crazy aunt. Everybody has a crazy aunt, but she was a really, she was really crazy. And my father's sister. And my grandmother wanted them to learn to play the piano. And my father, who I, I did a talk about, my father called a tribute to my father. My father was an award-winning pianist. He, be, he became very, very adept. But my aunt, who was a bit older, was just a neurotic mess. And she used to tell this story, which was great. She was doing the ritual fire dance in a competition. And if you know the ritual fire dance, you know that it, it goes round and round. And the only way it stops is if you, if you take the correct off ramp. You know, it has, it has a, an, an exit sign after the second repetition because they're identical, absolutely identical. And, and if you miss the off ramp, then you wind up back at the beginning again. Well, she missed the off ramp again and again and again. And she got stuck in the ritual fire dance and she didn't know how to get out of it. She forgot, so finally after playing it, she said like 15 times, she just looked around, slammed the piano, <laughs> walked up and just walked all the way home. And that was the end of her piano career. It was hilarious, especially to hear her tell about it. Anyway, so there we have the fire stuff and we get Chabrier's Espana and Ravel's Bolero. What is not to love, I ask you. And finally, Two discs, two wonderful discs. Again, it's like, yay, anthology of Varduela, Zarzuela, however you pronounce it, I don't know. Oh my goodness, this is fun music. I love Zarzuelas. Zarzuelas, in case you don't know, they, they are essentially Spanish, Spanish operetta, Spanish Offenbach, Spanish Gilbert and Sullivan, whatever you want. But there were some incredibly talented composers writing them, and the I mean, it's all very, very Spanish. It's full of local color and Spanish folk music. And oh my God, the music's wonderful. And you've got two discs of it here. I'm not going to go through all of the, the titles. I mean, you, you, these, are, these are important works. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of them. I mean, some of these are just wonderful. Doña Francesquita by Amadeo Vivas is just, I mean, these are masterpieces, absolutely masterpieces. And, and Thomas Breton, La Verbina de la Paloma. That's a really famous one, and it's just tremendous. Um, let's see, who else we have here? Geronimo Jimenez, uh, La Temporadica, and, and uh, oh my goodness, Manuel Panella, El Gato Montes. See, I said I wasn't going to say it. Well, I am, so, so shoot me now. And let's see, uh, oh, Ruperto Chapi, um, La Revoltosa, which is great. And let's see, who else have we got here? I mean, Chappie is really a good composer, by the way. Um, and let's see, Francisco Barbieri, the, the El, Bar, El Barberio de Lava Pies, the little barber of Lava Pies. It's really, it's, that's a famous one. And oh my goodness, there are just so many of these things. They're great. The music is wonderful. It's all done by, by vintage, authentic local talent. And again, I mean, Markevich was a chameleon. Whatever style he was working with, he could do. And he did do them, and he does do them. And you've got two wonderful discs, which actually should give you some ideas of, you know, uh, complete works that you may want to hear. I mean, all these things are available. You may have to order them from Spain because they are, they are extremely, extremely local in their reach. And it's just such a shame because it's a whole world with a huge, huge repertoire of wonderful, wonderful music that really deserves much, much greater currency. I mean, but operetta is, is you know, operetta is local. I mean, basically. I mean, it, re it really is. I mean, you know, people don't run around looking to hear Milliker or, you know, 
or you know, some of the other French people who wrote tons and tons and tons of operettas. And of course, there was there's Gilbert and Sullivan, who, you know, I just adore, but who I can't even speak to, you know, speak about to my friends from like Germany and France. Just doesn't travel. But I don't know why Zarzuela doesn't travel. It should. The music is so just devastatingly attractive. Anyway, anyway, let's let's just wrap this up. Markevich, the Phillips, the Phillips legacy. What a legacy it is. You want it. You need to own it. You must have it. Keep on listening, folks. Thank you for joining me. Take care.